Happy Halloween and welcome into another edition of Pittsburgh Post Game here on Pittsburgh Sports Live. This is a WVU West Virginia edition here of Pittsburgh Post Game with Pitt being off this week. This is your college post game talk here on Pittsburgh Sports Live, at least of the day. Of course, we're going to have some conversation with Corey Geiger and Nittany Sports now after the nightcap, Halloween night in Penn State's game against Ohio State. But for this broadcast, West Virginia gets the victory. The Mountaineers really trounced Kansas State, a ranked Kansas State Wildcats team. They're viewed now 4-2 and two on the year, so is K-State. West Virginia winning 37-10. to 10. I'm your host, as always, Mike Oste, and I am joined alongside, back again, the band back together here for the WVU postgame shows, by WV Sports Now's Tom Bragg, as the West Virginia high school season kind of winds down. He becomes more available to us throughout the Mountaineers season as that continues on. And Tom, this game was not scary, as maybe some thought, for the Mountaineers. This game was scary and was a frightening game for Kansas State. But Vegas thought it would go one way. People scratched their heads, as I kind of have done with all the Vegas spreads for WVU throughout most of this season. I didn't even think they'd covered as much as they ended up doing against Kansas. Vegas gets the victory again, along with West Virginia. Mountaineers get a big win, pretty much had it handily most of this game. Um, number one, obviously, what are your takeaways from this game? And then number two, what happened in this game Unlike last week, what did the Mountaineers do differently today in comparison to last week? How can a WVU team, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering this, how can a WVU team dominate a 16th ranked Kansas State team but lose to Texas Tech last week? How can you make that make sense? I don't know that you can. And if you followed WVU football for any length of time, that that kind of makes sense is that yeah, you, you know, I'm not surprised yeah, personally. Like, I'm like, asking like, for other people. <laughs> sure. It's, it's, it's a hard thing to make sense of Mike. You know, they looked, I don't, I don't want to say that they looked so bad because it's a game they were in last week, but it's sure. not a team that they should have sure. lost to in Texas tech. It seems like right. it might be the, the exception rather okay. than the, rather than the rule. And, and that's easy to say right now after a 37, 10, 37 to 10 win against a 16th ranked Kansas state team, just a great all-around win for West Virginia today and a night and day between last week. If you want to keep up the comparisons between that game, but the defense was fantastic today. I thought they were not up to par, up to their usual standard last week in Lubbock, and they were back at it again today. You saw it at all three levels. The uh, The defensive line was getting good push. The linebackers were making the plays they needed to make, and the guys in the secondary were not letting Kansas State throw the ball down the field at all, making interceptions. Uh, on offense, you limit – the mistakes that, that you make, Jarrett Dagey has a pretty good day. You spread the ball around. I think it was a right. long list of players. I don't know exactly how many, but a long list of players caught multiple passes for the Mountaineers today. And the big plays, the Mountaineers were able to connect on big plays time and time again. And you saw them eat away at the clock once they got out into that lead. And like I said, just if it was exactly what you needed, if you were West Virginia coming into today, after the last month of the season, where it's been kind of up and down and you were way down after you lose a game against Texas tech that yeah. you really had no business. That game had no business being close, let alone being a loss for West Virginia. So you, the chance to stumble and let one loss beat you twice was there today, but credit to Neil Brown and the staff. They didn't let these guys get down this week and they came out with a good game plan today and executed it. Yeah. To say the least, the Mountaineers definitely came out with a good game plan today. And you mentioned being so down after last week's loss, Neil Brown seemed down, even in those Zoom press conferences immediately after the game and even throughout the whole week. It seemed like that that was a game that the Mountaineers didn't expect to lose. And I don't know if maybe more went into that game um, as I fixed the mic there for live, live, live for a live broadcast, uh, I guess. But I don't know if the Mountaineers maybe got too up for the game just for Jared Deggie's homecoming and all that was made into that. Jared Deggie did appear a lot calmer in this game he did appear a lot better in this game whether or not the numbers bear that out he did certainly appear more efficient and that that did be, become um the case numbers wise in this game and it was really collectively across the board the offense was better the defense was better one thing i don't do want to touch on here again mike Osby, tom bragg the west virginia post game show here on pittsburgh sports live and of course wv sports now is this team was better all 
sides of the ball here today against Kansas State than they were against Texas Tech. And that is kind of what Mountaineer teams do, even though Neil Brown, once this team got going, said it wouldn't happen with him, unlike, say, some of the tenures of the past. But Lady Brown was able to get going early. And I think one key, and this is brought up by a WIBW reporter down there uh, covering Kansas State, just outside Manhattan, is that Kansas State hadn't seen a feature back like Lady Brown yet this year. Yes, they were four and one. They got over that weird loss to open up their season. They're winning all these conference games, but they hadn't got over. They haven't dealt with a featured back until Lady Brown. They're going to have Chuba Hubbard next week. So good luck based on this experience. But is that part of it that the Mountaineers were maybe a bad matchup for Kansas State too that people didn't realize the fact that they have a lead back leading the way offensively who can be a burner he got decent yardage early was able to get going just a little over 100 but involved very much early in the game was it maybe just a bad matchup for Kansas State regardless of what happened last week I I think that's part of it you look at what Letty did and he was able to get going early and kind of establish the run and make Kansas State respect that and that opened things up for Jarrett Deggie to throw the ball around a little bit but you look at the other side with what Kansas State was able to accomplish on offense which wasn't much credit to the West Virginia defense of course but you kind of wondered if this was going to catch up with them they've got a true freshman at quarterback Uh, Deuce Vaughn has been one of the best players in the Big 12 regardless of position so far and I think that's where West Virginia really really won this game they held him to 22 yards on just nine attempts That's if you told me going into the game that West Virginia was going to hold Vaughn to under 25 yards of oh West Virginia wins easy. And that's, that's what you saw today. That, that does seem to be, be the case. And yeah, Lady Brown able to get going early. If if W was going to win this game, it was going to be the running game early. That offensive line was going to hold. Deggie was not going to make mistakes. The defense was going to be that brick wall, certainly a defensive line, which was the case again today. And all of that happened to lead the Mountaineers to a victory what was different for the w defense because the defense obviously what was getting praised before last week number one defense in the country last week then some criticism came that maybe you hadn't played anybody besides Hubbard you faced Texas Tech they kind of hold a little bit late in that game they showed up again today against yes an inexperienced quarterback but a quarterback who was putting up numbers even a week ago uh, granted Kansas but that W defense played like they had earlier in this season, not just against anybody, but they did it against the number 16th ranked team in the country, regardless of what anyone may say about this being a different quarterback than that beat Oklahoma or this being a younger team and maybe some scheduling situation, regardless number 16 team, the defense played really, really well. Yeah. And if you want to do the compare and contrast game with what happened at Texas tech, they were able to get off the field on third down today. They were able to, capitalize when they forced turnovers against Kansas State today, turned some of those into points. And like I said, just was able to shut down Deuce Vaughn, whereas Texas Tech, and that goes back to the third down thing, Texas Tech was able to dink and dunk and stay ahead of the chains all day long, it seemed like, against West Yeah, Vaughn, eight carries, 18 yards, an average of 2.3 per, and that includes a seven-yard run. So besides that one run, he had seven other carries and did nothing. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't have a good day. So it's a recipe for a win for West Virginia, Mike. It's just as simple as it can be. It's, I mean, you could get into chopping this one up into into all the minutia of what (laughs) went right for West Virginia, but as a whole, it all went right for West Virginia. And I take that back. It didn't all go right. This game could have turned early, I thought. West Virginia misses the field goal. They go down and get inside the red zone and have to settle for a field goal. And I believe I tweeted out, right. you know, you leave 10 points on the field against Kansas State. When does that ever come back to bite anybody? Right. At that point, you, especially consider what had happened last week, you, you kind yeah. of think, oh, no, this is well, here we go. Here we go. I've read, I, yeah, I've the read this story before. I know how it yeah. ends. Right. But back to what uh, what I was saying early in the in the show here, credit to Neil Brown and the staff for getting these guys ready throughout the week and not letting them fold when things yeah. didn't go exactly right early in the game because we've seen this is – that's a good way to put this. This is a this is a team that that seems to thrive on emotion, good or bad. Right. When things are going well, they're going really well. But when things are going bad, the bottom falls out. Right. And you saw the possibility for that today, and it didn't happen. So yeah, credit to Neil Brown, the Mountaineer staff. They did a great job today. I think too, it was it was big to do such a great job this week after last week because really, obviously, he's going to get tons of of, of rope and 
Shane Lyons loves him and the administration loves him. And this is only his second year. Last year, kind of more of a year zero, the cover being bare. But if you get into this season where the wheels totally fall off, they only win two or three games, even with COVID, that would have certainly put pressure on next year to have a really solid season or eventually people are start are eventually going to wonder what's happening. However, that's that. this was a big win. This is certainly a big win for him, one of the bigger wins he's had, maybe the biggest win he's had based on last week. And, and they mentioned on the broadcast, you, you kind of touched on it too, that after what happened last week and knowing Kansas State, this is the worst team you want to play if you're giving points up early and you're facing a team that can come back on you after losing last week and maybe being down because they had to come back to Oklahoma. They've had to come back a lot this year. They managed to do it in prior weeks and this week. They end up getting blown off the field. Yeah, settling for field goals and special teams mistakes against K-State is a recipe for disaster 99% of the time, but right. West Virginia dodged a bullet today. But they had a good game plan. They came back. They got comfortable. They started spreading the ball around. You look, looking at the receiving numbers now, Winston Wright, Letty Brown, Bryce Ford Wheaton, Sam James, TJ Simmon, Michael Laughlin, <laughs> Reese Smith, Ali Jennings, Sam Brown, Sean Ryan, Isaiah Estale. Eight. Eight all of those, years. all of those guys were targeted at least, and three, three of those guys didn't catch balls. But still, that's eight receivers, all with multiple catches. Uh, Bryce Ford Wheaton quietly right. had a great day, three catches for over 104 yards. Yeah, and that goes, and that goes back to those big plays I was talking about. West Virginia was able to piece together the plays they needed, and whereas the defense for West Virginia was able to get off the field on third down today, West Virginia was able to extend some drives when they got third and mid range, maybe even third and long a couple times, but yeah, that was, that was the difference. The mistakes and the, the little things that drive coaches crazy that West Virginia has not been great at, especially last week, those were corrected to an extent today and and it all clicked and it worked out well. And and eight different receivers with a reception in this game. That's, that's great to see Jared Deggie over 300 yards passing with an efficient day of of a 163 quarterback rating 22 for 33 so it wasn't just like he had to throw 50 balls and then get to the yards. He had an efficient day, maybe one of his better days of his career as a view starter for sure as well. I think if anybody would have told you that the Mountaineers score 37, Deggy is over 300, he's efficient, and Winston Wright only had 31 yards receiving, you would have probably said that doesn't seem to make too much sense. But that's exactly what happened because he spread the ball around so much. This might even make Mountaineer fans think there's more to this offense than even had met the eye prior to this week, the emergence of Lady Brown, the emergence of Winston Wright, but now even more going on to this WU offense that maybe they can be more versatile in it, coming weeks with a harder schedule coming up. It all hinges on Jarrett Daggy. When Daggy uh, plays well, course. things right. go well for the Mountaineers. Right. And the worst case scenario is what you saw last week where Daggy's clearly off and the defense isn't playing like one of the best defenses in the country. And when Deggie's off, that's what it takes for this West Virginia team to be successful. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately for the Mountaineers, they have that in their pocket. They're capable of that. They can. But when it doesn't happen, you see what you see the result it's, from, it's from, really, really from last week. Today, yeah. the opposite. The defense played back at that level. Deggie played pre, for the most part mistake free football, 22 of 34, 301 yards, two yeah. touchdowns, no interceptions. A good day from Jarrett Daggy, and that's what happens when Jared Daggy's good as West Virginia wins, and they, and they look good doing it. You saw it last year yeah. at K-State as uh, they went out there and won that game in Manhattan. As they closed the season, Jared Daggy was playing pretty good football, and things were going well. They won on the road out at TCU to close the season. Same deal. Jared Daggy, mostly mistake-free football. They're able to get the win. When Jared Daggy doesn't make mistakes, West Virginia can win games. But when he starts throwing the ball to the other team, putting the ball on the ground, not converting those third downs. That's when West Virginia starts getting behind, and we've seen this isn't a team that's great at coming back from behind. No, and Jared Daigie is a quarterback that can be your quarterback while you win games, but he's not, who we'll segue here in a moment, he's not a Trevor Lawrence, he's not a Justin Fields. He can't take over a game on his own. He's not a Heisman winning type of quarterback, but he certainly is good enough to lead you to victories if, with if, his defense. If with he can weapons. do that, we've never seen him do it. Right. To yeah. be fair. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. He, he, yeah. He's still relatively young, but based on what we've seen to this point, he doesn't appear to be that guy, but he certainly is a guy that can lead you to wins. He's certain this numbers wise, maybe the best start he's had. I know talking to K-State, pe- K-State people too, this is a tough pill to swallow for them because not only does this, 
be it be a loss, their first conference loss. They still have that second overall loss from that opening game that's just weird now for their season. They go into Oklahoma State. It's a tougher schedule the rest of the way for them than even what the Mountaineers are dealing with. Could easily be two or three more losses. And after losing to WVU last week, that really does become a problem here. Just touching quickly on Kansas State here again, Tom Bragg, Mike Osta here on the WVU postgame show here on Pittsburgh Sports Live and, of course, WV Sports Now. Obviously, the Mountaineers want to get a victory and want, want to turn things around, and Mountaineer fans want to see their team get better and to win. But speaking of the overall conference, it's a down year for Oklahoma, who's barely ranked, and they've already lost a couple. Iowa State is a good team. Oklahoma State is a top-10 team. They're finally kind of picking up steam. They have some big games coming up with, with Chuba Hubbard and company, including the Kansas State next week. But Kansas State was a dark horse team to really vie in this conference based on their record at this point after getting over that first game, like first game loss. Now 4-2, and two, this is their first conference loss, but their schedule gets harder. Their meat of their schedule is coming up for our uh, what's at stake, still needing a stake sponsor segment for the other yes. side. Uh, we still do need that here, but for what's at stake for Kansas State moving on, um, I will ask you, does this win for the Mountaineers, and we've kind of already thought this to be the case with Texas not really being back and OU being down, but does this probably solidify that it's either Oklahoma State if or nothing, or maybe it really is nothing in terms of the Big 12 with a playoff chance? Because this now bumps Kansas State season a peg or so down, and they're going to lose again. So it's Oklahoma State really or bust, and if they would lose next week to K-State, the Big 12 basically done midseason. Is that pretty much the case? Yeah, it would be I think early so. to be done, but this is this this was a needed win. I feel like for the Big Twelve, uh, I think it, I think it would be too early to pronounce the playoff chance like dead and in the ground and buried, but it would okay. be on extreme life support, and only because you're waiting to see what happens with the Big Ten and the Pac-12. Sure, just on the case in the instance that say they cannibalize themselves the way the big 12 has yeah you've got, if penn state beats ohio state yeah, tonight penn, yeah say that happens penn state beats ohio state tonight you saw what michigan state's been beating michigan all day today right uh, if looks, trevor lawrence doesn't play to notre dame and that continues because right. he didn't play today and they certainly weren't nearly as good despite solid quarterback play no and you saw clemson started to come back some in the second half and, and took over that game but that was right dicey situation early for the time not happen in Notre dame too so i don't it's not a good situation to be in for the no. Big 12, only <laughs> no. having to depend on Mike Gundy with a month left. And COVID-19. For your hurting. Yeah, someone, yeah, with, yeah with, with, with COVID-19 <laughs> floating around and having to depend on Mike Gundy. Yeah. The, and we know how dependable Mike Gundy is, that it's not a good look for the Big 12. And I think it is Oklahoma State or bust. They've got to beat K-State. They've got to win Bedlam. They, they've got to beat Texas still, I believe. So that's – if they're the best team in the Big 12, they're going to have to earn it. I think they can. But you look at West Virginia now sitting there with two losses in the conference. That's not a terrible place to be. No, you know what you know – not, it's not whatever, at all. No, with what everybody have the game what, in hand over K-State despite yes, them having Yes, with what everybody losses. else has lined up. Now st- West Virginia still has to play Texas and Oklahoma, of course. Right. <laughs> Excuse me, but a lot of those teams still have to play Texas and Oklahoma. Oklahoma State, we just mentioned. Uh, uh-huh. K State already has played Oklahoma for sure. I don't believe they played Texas. No, yet. that's on the schedule coming up. So, yeah, there's, I mean, it could be madness as far as the playoff goes. That might be out the window, but it might be really fun down the stretch. To see who to see who gets that Big Twelve title, yeah. and, or Iowa State, we didn't yeah, into, into that Big Twelve title game, and and who, I guess then if the playoffs out, then you're playing for a spot in the Sugar Bowl if you're the Big Twelve champions. So still not a terrible spot to land. Obviously, no, no, you want to no. be in you want to be in that <laughs> you want to be in that top four, but yeah. there's still plenty to play for for these teams. But yeah, I think as far as the playoff goes, it's Oklahoma State or bust. But I've kind of talked myself into this now. I think this could be a fun little stretch to to end the season for Big 12 football if you're the kind of person like me who really enjoys chaos. 
Yeah, there could definitely be chaos in the Big 12. And if, if any other year there was a chance for chaos in the Big 12, not only just for the pandemic, but also for Oklahoma, regardless of the pandemic, anyone with a keen football eye saw, this is a vulnerable Oklahoma team, a younger quarterback, not a Heisman front runner, being a quarterback for Oklahoma this year. And they just seemingly haven't played defense for a few years, which now came back to haunt them. So they're, they're open. And Texas, despite them saying they're back all the time, they're not yet. So this does leave the door open and could make this really, really fun. I mean, Iowa State in there too. We didn't really mention them, but certainly they're a ranked team. They're certainly involved and they're going to play some of these teams rest of the way. If Kansas State would turn around and be Oklahoma State uh, next week, which is possible, that would maybe put that final probably nail in the coffin of the playoff. Yeah. But regardless, if that happens, it can make it really fun for the rest of the way and for the Sugar Bowl or whatever else. I just don't trust Iowa State, man. Now, Okay. September. We have to put them in, though. They're ranked. Sure, sure, sure. Not, so absolutely, abso- abso- absolutely, absolutely. I was just going off of conference wins and losses. And I think about you. Iowa State. I was so high on Iowa State going into last year and this year, too. They tricked me again this year. Brock Purdy, I think, is one of the best quarterbacks in the Big 12. Yeah. They've got one of the best tight ends in the country. They've always got good running backs. Matt Campbell is a good coach. Right. But September Iowa State and November November Iowa State have been two very different teams the last few years. So I'm curious to see what the Cyclones have coming up as as we get down the stretch here because they've been good down the stretch and they've gotten off to rocky starts and that's kind of put them behind the eight ball to to really get that momentum rolling and be among the leaders in the Big 12 where people expect them to be every year because of how they end the season. So Curious to see what the Cyclones have coming up these next couple of weeks. Uh, I can say, though, Tom, to maybe try to convince you a little bit of, of even more chaos and liking their chances just by default, that's the case for Iowa State. But say, for example, Oklahoma State, who is in the driver's seat right now, a 16th team in the country, a big game next week. They win that. They're really in good shape. They're a team that Mike Gundy is a beast in October, but once we get toward Thanksgiving and into the fall, not so much. So if he legs some eggs here, you're getting chaos and then some since they're clearly in the driver's seat. And that has now been solidified by yeah. again, West Virginia beating Kansas state. There's no debate there any for any further, but they could easily it would not shock me at all. If they lose to Kansas state uh, just for the way Mike oh, no, not tends, a, not, not tends, a, tends to work. Not at all. That was, I don't know if you could tell earlier, but my tongue was firmly planted in my cheek when I was talking about how dependable Mike Gundy is right, yeah, on the yeah, stretch yeah, in the yeah. past. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, it wouldn't. Buckle your seatbelt up. For I week. think, I think, Think it'd be hard to believe oh, it though. Mac, yeah. If they can't handle Letty Brown, it's hard to believe Chuba no. Hubbard is not going to. No, but I th- I think that Oklahoma State right now is the best team in the Big Twelve, but you never know. Just you never know with with Oklahoma State. They're kind of like we were just talking about. They're kind of like Iowa State. They seem to have very different personalities from month to month every season. It also and makes you it's wonder. Gone. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say it also makes me wonder with Oklahoma State that if they would have had a healthier team, what could happen this year? They're number six in spite of injuries, in spite of putting scotch tape on an offensive line, in spite of Hubbard not even being fully healthy last year despite his beat season. If this team the last two years could get healthy, you don't know. I mean, they're 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 in there by default and they're a top 10 team because Hubbard's starting to pick it up and they're winning, but just – even talking to the voice of the team three weeks ago, he was down on the club the rest of the way based on injuries yep. they were dealing with. So for them to be in this situation is almost a little bit of a surprise. Mm-hmm. You got to give them credit, but this big 12, the overall conference is down. And then honestly, Tom, you're not, not to make Mountaineer fans roll their eyes or turn this negative of a 37 to 10 win, but you know, what's going to be the thought process, even as high as some will say if the Mountaineers somehow sneak in there to a big 12 title game because of the chaos People are, are going to say, and it's going to be true, well, if you didn't lay the egg to Texas Tech, you'd have the championship, or you'd be in that game that you yeah. end up not being in because of that loss. That that bad loss to make it almost heaven instead of heaven is still on this resume, unfortunately. So it's already been put on the resume. They can't afford to have anything else on the resume like that, even the missed. Well, the that's, I think that's yeah. why you want to root for chaos right now if you're a Mountaineer fan. True. You want Absolutely. Oklahoma State to start dropping games. You want Texas – and Oklahoma to beat Oklahoma State at this point. You're in the odd spot of wanting those guys to win games, but That's you're also fine. now now you're rooting yeah. for Kansas State to lose games too. You do, you become not a fan of your buddies in the conference. <laughs> yeah, None yeah, of that yeah. conference solidarity stuff. You want the good teams to lose right. every game at this point. 
Right. And then that I think lessens the blow of that of that Texas Tech loss. Look, we can't get around it. Texas Tech was a bad loss last yeah. year. Yeah. And I think but, also to be fair, and we've said this before, I've said this before in my show, we said on post game shows. And to be reasonable here as well, I don't think anybody entering this season, COVID or not, was thinking the Mountaineers were winning the Big 12. Oh, no. So so the point is that if they flirt with the conference title game because of chaos or even get in the game and get blown out because of chaos, and then people say, well, they shouldn't have led the A to Texas Tech or they would have it. While that's true, it's still hard to be too upset because this team has shown what it can do against the good team today with a 37 10 win. Anybody that wants to, to get on to Neil Brown or West Virginia or Dar- Jared Daggy or whoever about that Texas Tech loss right mm-hmm. now or a month from now with them in the Big 12 title game, hypothetically, right. is an idiot. I'm going to yeah. say that right now. Is sure, a dude, dumb, stupid idiot. <laughs> Look at what they did today. Jared Daggy came back. These guys came back. If Those losses like last week are when, going to happen with a young team like this. When, when somebody – tells you who they are listen and this is a team that has shown an ability we've learned that a lot in this world yes yes <laughs> but they've shown an ability yeah to adapt to go back to the drawing board and try to figure it out sometimes it works out sometimes yeah. you have cases like last week where it does not work out at all but what did they do they went back to the lab they figured out a game plan to take one of very good Kansas State Which team. Is nice to see. Yes. And they thumped them. They whooped Kansas State today. It wasn't so even close. Anybody that's still hung up on Texas Tech after what they saw today, I don't know what to tell you, man. You're just trying to be negative for negative sake at this point. Yeah. Because well, this people, was a very this was a very good yeah, win. Right. And people do it. Yeah, just a very good win for West Virginia today. I can't I can't say that enough. The guys came to play. Jared Deggie didn't make mistakes. The coaching staff got these guys ready, as we talked about. Mm-hmm. They had a game plan coming into this, and then when things didn't go quite as well as you wanted to at the start, they navigated those rough waters and got the ship back on track. And it's right. a 37-10 to 10 win against a team that was unbeaten in Big 12 play and in first place in the league already. Number 16 team in the country. Right. I just, I don't, if you, if people want to be negative about Texas Tech still, I don't get it. This was a good win. Let's talk yeah. about this one. You know, and, and, I, and I know that Howard was the quarterback and Thompson's no longer there who beat Oklahoma, but he hadn't been there for several weeks. That's just the way of things. Thompson's are done him. for the year. That's a big right. thing for Kansas State. Like right. I was saying, you kind of waited for when the other shoe was going to drop with Will Howard because he's played well to this point, obviously. Yes, they're four, they're, they're four and the schedule sure, was this sure, is the sure. hardest game he would have played even with the Abs- abs- Absolutely, but that doesn't change the fact that he played well in absolutely. the game. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Absolutely. like I said, you were waiting for the other shoe to drop, and it did today with Will Howard. Now the thing for Kansas State will be, can they bounce back? How do they handle adversity, kind of like West Virginia handled adversity right. last yeah. week? You've got a big game next week, and if you're the Wildcats, you can't let one loss beat you twice. If you go out and lay an egg because you're still upset or dwelling on what happened in Morgantown this week, then Oklahoma State's going to blow your doors off, and you yeah, don't even have a can. chance. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I know that that yeah. that's true for Kansas State, and I think yeah. also maybe they've also realized now um, because Kansas State was pretty much running almost the same offense with Howard in there versus Thompson. They pretty much said, "Okay, Thompson's hurt. You're in there. It's just going to be the same situation again." He was running. Oh, that's Kansas. That's week. that's Kansas State. They've been running the same offense I, since well, you and I were in diapers, I, dude. I, I, I understand <laughs> that, but I'm saying maybe there's a thought process of, of, of pulling it back a little bit or changing some plays because these are not the same type of quarterbacks. I guess is what I'm saying. But yeah, there's a big game next week. Anyone who wants chaos, anyone who wants some fun football, we got college football in the midst of a global pandemic. We got it during the fall. Get excited. I'm looking for chaos now. We're not supposed to root here covering teams, but I'm, I'm all about it next week. Chaos um, so isn't that, a team, though. You can root for chaos. Yeah, so I'm going to root for chaos. We're going to root for chaos here, and that certainly goes to maybe the game of the year for the Big 12 in terms of what sets the table for the rest of this season is Kansas State off the loss. We need to turn it around versus Oklahoma State that usually falters. He is top 10 right now, and a win gives them the driver's seat. He lost changes things immensely. That might be the biggest game of the year next week for those two. The Mountaineers schedule also does not get any easier either. Uh, What do you expect for the Mountaineers the rest of the season as we round things out and then get to some Trevor Lawrence talk with what's going on, the weirdity of his situation here to close out the show. Tom Bragg, WB Sports Now, Mike Oste here on the West Virginia postgame show here on Pittsburgh Sports Line. WB now 4-2, 37-10 
on a spooky day, but not spooky on the football field for the Mountaineers as they scare Kansas State right off of things as I continue the puns for Halloween Day and get a 37 to 10 win, four and two on the year now. But what are your thoughts, the Mountaineers, the rest of the schedule? We're talking a lot of chaos. We're talking about predictions. If they can get in there, if they can make up the Texas Tech game. It is a young team. Those things are going to happen. Schedule certainly does still have some tough games the rest of the way. After seeing the, the capability of this team, which I can say after last year being year zero, the cover being bare, and this year the team getting together, this is the best win for Neil Brown. This is the best win for Jared Deggie for me. But can that segue the rest of the way? Or are you maybe still expecting a roller coaster ride because this is still a rebuilding season that maybe next year was more supposed to be the year of what we're actually talking about? Well, I expect a roller coaster ride 100%. They play at Texas next week. They've got TCU at home the week after that. You've got a week off before going, excuse me, getting Oklahoma at home. And then you close on the road the first weekend of December at Iowa State, where it will probably be, oh, I don't know, negative 30 degrees with the wind chill. <laughs> and of, they always uh, have problems. Minus, the minus, yeah. minus 100. And it's just. Oh, it's like Hoth out there. I love Des Moines. Iowa State people were always really good to me in our trips out there. The folks in Ames are super nice, super accommodating. But, man, the weather sucks out there. And going out there December 5th is going to be – we'll see. But, yeah, up and down. Start with Texas next week. Who knows what Texas team you're going to get, but who knows which West Virginia team you're going to get. Are you going to get the one that went and stunk at Texas Tech last week and turned the ball over and was just a mess in special teams and – kind of read too many of their own press clippings on defense and let a very, 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 very average Texas Tech defense score way too many points on you? Or are you going to be the one that showed up today and shut down one of the best running backs, one of the best players, period, in in the Big 12? Because let me tell you, Sam Ellinger, he gets a lot of crap, and, and deservedly so. And I wrote a column this week about how the Big 12 doesn't necessarily feel like home to West Virginia, and part of that is you don't have these rivalries or teams that you get really excited yeah, yeah. for. But Texas right. Texas is different because Texas is Texas. Texas is the snotty kid with the most punchable face on the planet, and it feels great when you get to take a swing at him. And yeah. Sam Ellinger, well, like Oklahoma too, but they got the win over Texas. Well, well yeah, that's what I'm getting at, I, and that's what I wrote. They're you know, more Oklahoma, beatable. Oklahoma's in the same category, but you haven't beat him yet, so you don't know what punching that guy feels like. You've punched Texas right. a couple times, and it feels sweet when you do it. And Sam right. Ellinger is kind of the embodiment of that, but he's good, man. That's going to be the best quarterback they've played so far this season. Might be the best quarterback they play all year long. That is going to present problems for West Virginia. Texas can play. We saw a great game with them against Oklahoma in the Red River game a few weeks ago. They've kind of started – not rolling, but kind of finding themselves a little bit, figuring out more of what they're going to be about after not looking great in the win against the, what was it, overtime against Texas Tech several weeks ago that when we were on the show trying to find out yeah, what yeah. was happening. Overtime, it might even have been double overtime, if I can remember correctly, yeah. But Texas seems like it's kind of starting to get its feet under it. But West Virginia, after today, you could say the same thing. So I expect a – well, that's a good way to put it. A, I expect the unexpected whenever West Virginia and Texas play. <laughs> but but B, I expect a competitive game. I don't think anybody's getting blown out. I, I expect we, competitive games the rest of the season, potentially, honestly. If it uh, ends up being, you know, a 21-17 game, I wouldn't be surprised. But if Texas finds a way to score a little bit on that West Virginia defense, I think after today, you maybe you got some confidence. You've seen that you can spread the ball around. Letty Brown is a horse and is hard to bring down. I think the West Virginia offense has maybe a little bit of confidence, a little pep in their step. If Texas wants to get into a shootout, maybe they see what they can do with that. And I think the Mountaineers, too, and the way this game unfolded offensively will actually add to that confidence and that pep in their step because I think they're also going to say to themselves, if we get down, if we get in a shootout, we have to come back. It's not just Winston Wright. We have a lot to deal with receiver-wise. We can even throw Lady Brown out there. He can. They're going to, I'm sure, give a lot of Lady Brown early in these games to try to get a lead and, and beat down these opposing defenses. Yeah. So they have a game plan. It seems like they're finally figuring out. They didn't get, get it done. Getting, right. getting sink field going today was important. Right. Too, yeah, yeah, I yeah, thought yeah. he wasn't a superstar or anything, but he, the game. but he had his most productive day. I want to say of the season, maybe even going back his most productive day in two years, almost today. For sure. 
just from the standpoint of getting that confidence going that I was talking about, you've got other options. It doesn't have to be Letty Brown over and over and over yeah. and over again. Now you've got that ability. And if you need to go to that, well, it, you, you've got that bullet in your chamber if you need it. But, but I, I think Lady Brown's better with 25 or so carries than he is with 35 or so carries. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, if absolutely. you can, if you can, as you see here, Lady Brown 24, Sagfield 14, 85 yards for him. So certainly his best day, but that's a good spread. Even if it's 25 to 10, that's a better spread than making Lady Brown be the complete yeah. workhorse. He's not Ezekiel Elliott out there. So no, and, and, and situationally, you look at, Sinkfield's numbers today yeah only 81 yards on on 14 carries the yards per carry is not all that great well it's 6.1 not too was, bad he was busting big plays when he needed them when West Virginia needed yeah, them at a 36 drive, yarder yeah yeah keeping drives alive and that's something that I've harped on a lot today because that's what killed them last week is not being able to stay in front of the sticks while the defense was not able to keep Texas Tech's offense off the field you yeah. saw, I'll hit it again one more time while we're wrapping up here. You saw that change today, and it's a 37 to 10 win versus an awful loss to Texas Tech last week. So, what West Virginia did today is the recipe for this West Virginia team. We talked about yeah. when somebody tells you who they are, you should believe them. West Virginia told us who they were today. We, and should, we should believe them, should but believe I will them. also yeah. say, opposing teams opposing defenses opposing yeah. defensive coordinators also may believe them so they're going to say this is what they can do this is what we now need to stop whether they can is going to be a different question because there's a lot a lot in the well that's the a, that's the that. thing though it wasn't just one thing that they uh, did, yeah that there's they, a lot that, that they did well today and, and football i'm a firm believer in football is about making the other team uncomfortable with what you're trying a to lot do. of reason in, to be uncomfortable in, in, imposing you imposing your will against the other team and when it when it works it looks good and it looked good for for West Virginia today obviously it's the trick is being able to do that on a consistent basis week after week and when you get to that level you see the Alabamas the Clemsons mm -hmm. even the Oklahomas and the you know, Ohio States of the world yeah. they make uh, they make other teams more concerned about what Ohio State is going to do to them versus what you're going to versus do. what they're going to do to Ohio yeah. State and, and that's how the wheels fall off against yes teams. It, right. exa exactly right. and that's what happened today for West Virginia it's catching that lightning in a bottle and figuring out how to reproduce it, yeah, and it that's, and that's, the, it, that's the trick now and it might have become an issue for Kansas State the middle of this game yeah. if you got a little bit of a lead they might have started thinking we got to stop this 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 and they totally got out of a strategy for themselves they never put any more points on the board it ended up being 37 to 10 Tom Bragg WB Sports now Mike Osta here on the West Virginia Post Game Show here on PSL uh, Tom I do want to ask you real quick before we get to some brief conversation on what we think the situation is going to be here with Trevor Lawrence and whether that's going to impact the committee in terms of deciding for the playoffs, certainly because they're very vulnerable right now based on today's outcome. Clemson does win 32 to 28, but uh, without him, that almost certainly could have been a loss. Um, Casey Leg, the news kicker, uh, a weird, interesting background that we're talking about off air and on Twitter that I'm not sure everyone's aware of. No football career prior to the Mountaineers, which is major big 12 football Tell us about what he was doing that led him to becoming a kicker with the Mountaineers. He has the last name that makes sense, but what else <laughs> led him to this path? Well, Casey Leg was a soccer player in high school <laughs> at a small Christian school in Cross Lanes, which little suburb about 10 minutes outside of Charleston. Mountaineer fans familiar with it. It is where the casino is located that Dana Holgerson got in that trouble at okay. when he first became yeah, right down right right down right down the right down the road here. I actually okay. live in Cross Lanes. I'm broadcasting you live from Cross Lanes oh, right it now. It fits all together. So Casey Legg went to a small little Christian school named Cross Lanes Christian and played soccer. They don't have football at that school, so he didn't. That's the thing. Yeah, there was just yeah, no football to couldn't play. Even do it right. And I, you know, he got, I'm not sure exactly how he got involved in kicking, but it was soccer based. He was very good at soccer and he got into some kicking camps, obviously not playing for a football team. That was the only chance he really had to, to get experience kicking, to figure out if he liked it and to figure out if he was any good at it. And it turns out right. he was pretty good at it. Yeah. And right here in the backyard, that was one of the ones that uh, Dana Holgerson and his staff were able to get on campus and get, get committed to West Virginia. He, as we said, had never played a down of football 
and it was two years ago in Morgantown against Baylor. West Virginia was blowing the doors off of Baylor. I believe it was a Wednesday night, a, a Wednesday or Thursday night game. I remember that Big 12 basketball media day was in Kansas City the day before, and I had to fly Kansas City into Pittsburgh and drive straight to the stadium to get there right as that game started. But long story short, not really. But <laughs> We've all had those ass nine tails that we won't yeah. bore the listeners with. Yes, not, not really. But anyhow, so Casey Legg got into that game just had to be rushed on the field. I forget exactly what the situation was, but West Virginia needed a kicker on the field for a kickoff. First college play ever, first football play ever. Casey Legs kicking off in a Big 12 game against Baylor. He makes the tackle on the, on the play. Yeah. Yeah. He saw he got in some playing time last year with Evan Staley's injuries in the back half of the season. Saw that kind of crop up again today. Staley missed that field goal early and, and didn't look good, didn't look comfortable, came off the field, went to the locker room. Uh, hopefully our guy Cody Nesper will get to the bottom of that one or somebody will ask uh, <laughs> Coach about that one in the post game. just get an update on right. Staley's status. But Casey Legg came in today and, and I thought looked good. He didn't look like a world beater, but he looked steady and confident and for all of the good that Evan Staley has done for West Virginia over the years, he has not been steady and he has not looked confident lately. And if chaos is going to reign and you're going to be in these dog fights in the big 12, you need a kicker that can make a kick that you can trust trot out there and think, okay, this is probably going to go in versus, Oh boy. I don't know. Should we go for it? I don't know if he's got the leg. Yeah. Yeah, Neil Brown clearly believes he has the leg based on the the yeah. attempts the team yeah. sent him out there for whether he makes yeah, them you, or you, you, not. T- you talk about his leg and his name being appropriate for being a kicker, and I tweeted this at you, and I swear I'm not making it up. His dad's an orthopedic surgeon here in yes. Charleston, so <laughs> yeah, so it's Lots perfect. Of, it's a they, perfect storm. It was his yes. destiny, and it's very much for the brand. So I think Pat McAfee and him should have a conversation. Well, I'm Pat not sure McAfee. if his mom designed shoes or what, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would that would be well, yeah. But Pat McAfee <laughs> uh, getting his start as a soccer player in Western Pennsylvania in my neck of the woods um, in Western PA. Here he was at Plum High School, so a different side of Pittsburgh. But nonetheless, he got his start very similar. Unlike. Casey, he didn't have any solid tackles to open up his career, though. He was just kicking. And his school did allow football. They had a football team. He just was a soccer player. So this is even more uh, crazy with Casey Legg really having no opportunity to play football and ends up being a kicker for a major team, a major team and a major conference. And not bad at it either. Not bad at it at all. No, No, he doesn't look like somebody who had never kicked in a football game period before. And I think we should also say that just because you can kick in someone's backyard or playing soccer where you're running during the kicking or even for some boots, it's different than to say you can kick accurately as a place kicker in either major college football or the NFL or really any level. Sure, sure. And I think that's why you go to those those kicking camps and they get the private private instructors and the uh, the the just all of the off season circuit stuff that the kickers that that play high school ball do. If you don't have high school ball, it's all you got, I guess. And that's what that's what Leg right. did, and that's how you found him. But it wasn't just like uh, Dana went and plucked this kid off the soccer field at Cross Lanes Christian and was like, hey, come on, up. <clears throat> come on up here and kick this ball for me. He that's might have done that. that. <laughs> I mean, he, he might have, but it was after he saw some kicking camp stuff. Yeah, he might have <laughs> shown up and done that, but it was after he had a, he had some tips on why he should be there. Uh, Tom Brack here, Mike Ossie again, as we round things out uh, here on the WVU postgame show for Pittsburgh Sports Live and WV Sports Now. Tom, we're going to round it out with kind of the story of the day, even though he did not play. Trevor Lawrence, who, if this college football season was going to get screwed up and somebody was going to argue for just cutting the cord, it was because one of these guys ended up with COVID-19 and it ends up impacting this season. Trevor Lawrence, Heisman favorite, Heisman winner at national champion, future NFL product and all the, all of that ends up testing positive for COVID-19 does not play today because of that. His team, despite adequate play, a quarterback didn't have the big plays. They almost lost. They had to come back to even get the win over Boston college. They have that big game next week against Notre Dame. We're looking at the timeline, whether or not he can play in that game, but that's going to be a huge conversation of this week because Notre Dame, they have North Carolina later, that's a big one, but this is the game for the ACC, really. They are the team that can knock off Clemson if anybody's going to, especially with them being in the ACC this year. If Clemson, if, North, if Notre Dame would get a win without Trevor Lawrence, 
what would that do in terms of the committee? Would they not give their name as much credit as normally they would obviously for a Clemson win? Would they not ding Clemson as much as normally they would get dinged for just losing in general? And if he does play, is that your expectations, I guess? I mean, if he does play, they're a heavy favorite, but do you expect him to play? And if he doesn't play, how can that impact the rest of the season? Will the committee almost treat that as a mulligan because you don't have the best quarterback in the country there, or will they still give equal credit because it's just COVID-19 and injuries and that's what's you know, going to happen? Well, I'm, I'm not sure that he'll be back for Notre Dame. Doesn't appear so, but there's his – the announcement today was that obviously he wasn't playing in this game. Dabo has said repeatedly he he wants to push him to the Notre Dame game. You need a 10-day absence. That was why Les Miles couldn't get there to coach for Kansas against WVU. It appears that would be, what, eight or eight days after the positive test, so that wouldn't be the timeline. But I don't think they can budget. Dabo saying he's going to play. That's going to be a controversy. I, I guess I'll put yeah, it that and way. If he doesn't play, if you've that's seen, going to be a part of it. if you've seen a photo of Dabo Swinney this year, that guy can't get his mask up over his nose. Yeah, of so he of course Clemson's know quarterback came yeah. down with COVID. They've just basically been inviting right. it into the program over there. Yeah, they do. Deserve- so I'm not. I'm not. I don't know that they deserve it, but I'm not surprised <laughs> at all that they. I don't think anybody right. deserves it. But sure, sure, am, sure. Am I shocked that right. Clemson's quarterback? came up with COVID after they've just kind of thumbed their nose at the, not so much him, but his coach and the, and a lot of the college football administration of uh, all, all along the country have kind of thumbed their nose yeah. at this thing. It was just bound that a big name was going to come down with it at some point. And it's well, hopefully, hopefully it, Hubbard doesn't get it too. Cause yeah, the other coach has been thumbing it, his nose is Mike Gundy. Yeah. But it sucks that Trevor Lawrence got it. Cause he's so much fun. Yeah, and he's so good. It really does. As far as the playoff committee goes, if Notre Dame wins the game next week, you know, Lawrence or not, they're in the driver's seat. Oh, they're in the driver's seat, but what if they win a close game? Does that, my point, I guess, would be. Here's the thing. Here's the, here's the thing though. I don't think that you can ding Clemson that much because they are not, it's not like it's the Trevor Lawrence show at Clemson. Travis Etienne is one of the best running backs in the country ever in college football. He just set the ACC record for rushing yards today. They have five star guys all over both sides of that line at receiver, all three levels of the defense. That team is stacked. The quarterback that's backing up Trevor Lawrence, not a lot of experience, not going to try to pronounce his name because it's worse than two. He didn't play that bad today though, honestly. He didn't play terrible today, but that's another day. He's Cam Newton, dude. Have you seen him? He's like six, five, 240 pounds. He can pirouette and do backflips and crap. like. (laughs) Yeah. You know, if I don't think, Trevor Lawrence being out that you can ding anybody for beating Clemson. No, obviously Clemson still has some of the most. Uh, What I think you might have a a point with though, is that the committee might take it kind of easy on Clemson. That's what I'm asking. If, if they were to suffer a loss, I think. That's what I'm asking because Tom, not to cut you off. We're getting, obviously once we get towards the end of the season, when the committee starts coming alive, it is their opinion. Their yeah. opinion is yeah. involved. So obviously they, they, it would not shock me in any way if Clemson would still win that game. It, they could. No, they, no, they, no. I would, I would, they, I would, they, they, they certainly could still win the game. And I actually will say this to be fair. If Notre Dame loses a close game against Clemson, even without Trevor Lawrence, maybe, but beats North Carolina, beats the Bricks off, they've been winning and they went out the rest of the way, they have a pretty, really, really good situ- argument to be in that playoff still. My well, Notre, Dame, you, Notre Dame's a hammer. If their only loss is Clemson, Trevor Lawrence, 100%, 100%. or me, me and you playing quarterback, they're still an awesome 100%. team. So my question, I guess, to you then would be, if Notre Dame wins – we agree they should be and probably will be in the playoff regardless of what else happens. And if they're not in, they certainly can argue all day on Twitter. So separate from that, if they get the win, Clemson then would have the rest of the season still to perform, pr- figuring Trevor Lawrence is coming back. Say they went out and they have one loss without Trevor Lawrence because they got today's win even without him. Does the committee say, well, if they had Trevor, they would have won. So then does the committee do the unthinkable with a conference that has not been really that deep recently and say, the ACC now has two teams, which means probably Ohio State if they went out for the Big Ten. And then you're looking at Georgia, Alabama. One of those teams is definitely left out because some are still arguing Georgia despite the loss. Do they put two ACC teams in if Notre Dame wins without Trevor Lawrence because the committee gives Clemson a mulligan due to COVID-19? Does that happen? 
I don't know. That's if what does, I'm asking. I don't know if that does happen, but it's Good. certainly possible. It's absolutely That's within the realm of possibility, too. and I wouldn't be surprised at all if it happened. But look, here's the thing: if there was a year in which the ACC popped up and absolutely deserved, you know, this is it. had two teams of that caliber. It's this year because you've got Notre Dame included with the ACC for playoff purposes. Yeah, and Miami's number 11th, and these teams have already beat them handily. And I think yeah, they're a little overrated, but they got their number 11 in the country. Yeah, Miami may be a little bit overrated, but Notre Dame and Clemson, my, I mean, Notre Dame, Clemson, Alabama right now, take your pick. They've looked like the three best teams. Sure. The and, then, and then if, so if Ohio State takes care of business tonight, if they don't, it's really going to be Tom Bragg's chaos that he loves so much. Yeah. But if they do, then that puts them in the driver's seat, barring what else goes on to be that. Bring on, team. bring on BYU. And then it, then it, then it probably leaves out everybody who's bang, banging on the drum for Georgia right now. Is they're going to be the Lord Almighty of being the fifth ranked team in the country? They went out. That's where they're going to end up falling. From. They only scored fourteen points against Kentucky today. They won, but they only right. scored fourteen points. I'm not saying I put them in right now. They already have a loss with all this chaos going around them. But th- that conversation with them, if this occurs. I would hope dissipates a little bit because you, I don't see how you can have, you can't have two a- SEC Georgia, and two Georgia, ACC. Someone's Georgia, getting left out. Georgia's a fraud. Alabama's going to take their head off. I think that's going to be the differentiating factor. You look at the two that conferences. That would really be chaos if they don't. Though. Well, you, Yeah, <laughs> but you look at the two conferences with legitimate claims to, to having two playoff teams in each of them. When Clemson and Notre Dame play, if it's close, then versus then they should both then okay those are still those are two teams who are and, who and i think the committee were. wants clemson if, in there if, if they have one loss to a top 15 team sure, because they're sure, defending sure. and you know them and you don't want it you want Notre Dame in there for the brand and the fact they're very very deserving so i almost i almost can make the guarantee if, if Notre Dame beats clemson and the rest of them went out and they went out i don't know how you don't have both of them in honestly if Notre Dame beats Clemson, I think Notre Dame is a lock to get into the playoffs. And I, I don't know how Clemson now, left out if they went out. I think it'll be tough, and I think it will depend on the SEC. At they that only point. have how one the- other top 15 team. That would be the reason they don't get put in. The only other quality win they would then have is Miami, who we're agreeing is overrated. I think, they, I think Clemson has enough built-up goodwill. Sure. But that. the schedule for this year, which is what it, you would love it to be about, even though it's but, not. But, but, it, but it's not. You know, it I mean, it's Clemson, <laughs> Clemson is Clemson. You look, you could look at the schedule and the numbers all day long, and you could still come to the sure. realization that this team's sweet. You know, they're they're one of they're the four good. Best they're going to have NFL draft. They're, they're one of the four best teams in the country now. Obviously, the wheels could fall off. You know, they could lose a couple games. It would be crazy to think that. But I don't have a problem sitting here today and saying. Clemson without Trevor Lawrence is one of the four best teams in the country. Trevor, uh, Trevor Lawrence really? on Clemson makes them yeah. possibly the best team in the country. But Alabama's very good, as we said. Ohio State is very good, as we've said. BYU's been smashing people. Cincinnati's been smashing people. Those group of five teams are going to make it interesting. If chaos reigns like we talked about, and you've got undefeated BYU and undefeated Cincinnati sitting there at the end of the yeah. year, just throw a wrench in everything. I mean – there's going to be pitchforks. You throw a wrench. There's going to be pitchforks and torches in the street. You know what would happen too, and uh, you and I again are on that bullseye chart. If one of those teams sneaks in this year, even with COVID and everything going on, UCF, who's been irrelevant this year, those fans would throw chairs because of what happened to them three years ago, because the schedules would be similar. To, and, 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 and to them, I would say, who cares? That was three years ago. It was a different. Yeah. It was and a different unfortunately, though, they do care. They're, three years ago, it was going to be their present day year a, forever. It was a different scenario. Well, good. Sure. Good. Good for them. <laughs> you know? Sure. Um, yeah, no, I hear you, though. And there's tons of chaos that can definitely happen. I would even make that argument, even if Notre Dame loses, even without Trevor Lawrence, I could absolutely argue yeah. for that because they've been yeah. really, really good. And as long as they beat North Carolina later on in the year. And I think in that scenario, that's when Notre Dame starts play in the comparison game with the sec teams yeah. like okay we're i've got one loss so do you so do you that's when you Who's start worse. hoping you you start rooting for chaos in the sec if you're Notre Dame, you want alabama to have one loss because alabama with one loss is still going to get in the playoff sure right if alabama has one loss and georgia doesn't have any you want ohio you're, state to lose then, then you're in trouble i think the big one for the big 12 that we talked about earlier is that ohio state penn state game tonight you're rolling for penn state you want the Big Ten to blow up 
at the yeah. top, just like the top of your schedule has or top of your um, standings have blown up. And then you hope Oklahoma State can start running the table because otherwise, as we talked about earlier, it's going to be it's going to be tough for the Big Twelve to get into the playoff. Sugar Bowl, not a bad pillow to land on if you don't don't hit that playoff target, but you want you want to hit the playoff. And yeah, it would be it would be it would be an interesting off season for the Big Twelve if they got shut out. Of the, of yeah, the, I'll put it and down. if ever there was going to be a year to get shut out, because they always have that team in Oklahoma that if they just get close to it, the committee's going to bump them in because they love Oklahoma, but they're not vying really for it this year because of their circumstances. So yeah, they got two losses already. They're done. Yeah, they're done. So they're it certainly done. opens things up for this conference to be left out altogether, especially with Texas who being another darling, having already lost. If they were undefeated and had won the rivalry game, that would be different. But they that's not the case. So again, it certainly opens uh, opens things up. Uh, I will say, though, to not get criticized for an East Coast bias, if you're the Pac-12 team, you also need to root for Penn State to win. You also need to root for chaos because you're most likely getting left out. You don't really have a team good enough this year, but you need tons of chaos for yourself to be involved as well. Uh, For Tom Bragg here and for WV Sports Now, of course, for all of us throughout the Pittsburgh Sports Now family of networks and Pittsburgh Sports Live, I was your host, Mike Osti, the Mountaineers, Get a Halloween Day victory over Kansas State, sending Kansas State into the grave a little bit, at least for the day, with a 37-10 win. Mountaineers now 4-2 and two on the season. Another conference victory, so obviously that a big deal for WU. And as I keep saying every week, we'll see. We will see the rest of the way, and uh, we will see if chaos truly ensues, and many of us will kind of deep down hope that chaos truly ensues in suits.